What is up guys, Wrestling Premiere is here. Okay, I wanted to go with a pay-per-view, but since I haven't done a special episode, I have to go with a ladder. Now, will I do some pay-per-views? Yes. I'm not sure if I'm going to do ECW One Night Stand. If I do one of those, I'm going to have to do the other. And I, I'm still considering whether or not to do it. If you guys really want it, I'll definitely do it for that, for sure. But other than that, I think I'm going to do Extreme Rule 2009, a Vengeance pay-per-view, either 05 or 06, or maybe even 07. I'm not sure which ones to go with. But for the last couple of weeks, I didn't want to saddle you guys with too much pay-per-view videos. You know, we got to talk about storylines and runs and title reigns. So that's the reason why I haven't made one of those pay-per-view videos in a while. With that said, just comment down below what June pay-per-view would you guys like me to talk about. You know, I'm looking to do a few of those pay-per-views during the month of June. With that said, I have some memories of this this draft but it's blurry for the most part i remember that battle royal the opening match and of course mr mcmahon's limo looks blowing up but other than that i don't remember much but with that said let's go back to a time which i look back on fondly now one thing to know is that this episode was mr mcmahon appreciation like the man was on some sort of substance after losing the ecw title you know it was the only thing keeping him sane this show is held in the wachovia arena in wilkes Bear, pennsylvania WWE at the time had a bunch of injuries, and the star power was dwindling quickly. That's that, Batista had a cheat code for main event title shots. I want my rematch. Things were kind of hard, and this is before the summer even began. So there was a struggle already. <laughs> Mr. McMahon opened up the show reciting a speech in a very odd tone, and it's like somebody else entered his soul and spoke using his voice. He revealed that many will speak about him because he wanted the true representation of who Mr. McMahon is. You know, this was appreciation night. Iconic Raw intro plays, Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler welcome everybody to the show, but they weren't alone at ringside though, why? Smackdown's Michael Cole and JVL were there as well, ECW's Joey Styles and Taz were there to call their wrestlers matches, and the opening match was for the first draft pick. The WWE Champion John Cena represented Raw, and his opponent though was a very familiar foe, it was Edge, the World Heavyweight Champion, representing Smackdown. Jerry Lawler was completely shocked at the thought of a champion versus champion match. One thing to know is that this was the first time in about six months that Cena faced Edge in a singles match. Both men were in midst some of their best runs. You know, Edge was given the keys to Friday nights, and Cena was one of the best wrestlers from 2007. Okay, so the bell rings. Collar and elbow tie up. Cheap shot from Edge goes south, leading to a fisherman from Ross Champ. Cena bumps into the turnbuckle, leading to a huge blow from the rated R superstar, and Edge began stinging Cena with a few strikes, leading to a one count. He tried to bounce back quickly, but ends up being kicked to the outside. Sunset flip from John leads to a near fall but Edge quickly clotheslines the WWE Champion. It was back and forth competitive action and you could see the chemistry these guys had. They never had a disappointing match and just as Cena tries building some sort of momentum, Edge blasts him with a random move. This time it was a spinning heel kick. Little reversal here leads to a big boot. Mid-match headlock of course leads to John escaping. He tried going for the STFU but Edge was clever in reaching for the ropes before any damage could be done. Following this, he has to face Buster Bro was unable to go for a cover and begin his comeback, but he did just that a few seconds later though. Shoulder tackles, little slam that you can't see me in the five knuckle shot. Nope. Edge goes through the ropes and they brawl on the outside. Cena lost focus, opting to clear the announce desk, and as he's going for the FU, Edge rakes him in the eyes and wins the match. You stupid idiot. In kayfabe, John Cena's dumb. You know, he's opting to destroy Edge, whereas the world champion was smart as hell in winning the match by count. Now he was intelligent. It was decent, you know, we got to see these two go at it again, and it was of course going to be limited because of the fact that it was a TV match, but it was fun. With the win, MS Smackdowns won the first draft pick. The random program plays, they built up all the suspense, you know, who's it going to be? And it ends up being the Great Kali. Edge is speechless and Cena's got a grin on his face knowing what's to come. I remember this moment, I was happy that the Great Kali was going to Smackdown because I was like, oh, Edge, he's going to get his ass beer or whatever. And just believing in Kayfabe back then, it was the best thing. Like, believing in kayfabe was so damn fun, you believe in everything that's going on, and it was just such a fun thing, you know, it made the shows much more interesting, I was so into kayfabe. Moving on, they had the former governor of Minnesota, Jesse the Body Ventura. He made it seem like he was gonna honor Mr. Well, he actually refused to call him that, often to call him McMahon, like the old days. He thought this was a selfish idea and called WWE a dictatorship. In his eyes, this was anything but benevolent, and lastly said, every dictator falls. Meanwhile, the coach announced that the Vengeance main event will be some sort of champion's challenge. You know, Cena defends the gold against anybody who asks. They've gotta be a former champion, however, though. The next match was between Carlito, Raw, and CM Punk ECW. So at this point in time, both men were heading in different directions. Punk was on the up and Carlito was on the down. In Punk's case, not many on ECW were as popular as him and with the roster being thin, it gave him the opportunity to quickly break through. Carlito had his issues in the back when he was even chastised on live television. Goes to show how bad things were, but then again, he was being paid six figures, so it couldn't have been that bad. Okay, collar and elbow once more. Carlito opts to go the unethical route, and Punk responds with a kick. As he goes for that corner knee, Carlito had it scouted and quickly delivers some strikes. Punk was more with the kicks, and as he goes up to Brett's rope, Carlito catches him with a drop kick. Intelligent. Oh, you guys remember that raw energy drink or whatever? Like, they were promoting it harder than their own shows themselves. 
Anyways, Carlito took control of the suplex and began working on Punk's ribs. He of course struggled to escape this body scissors, but he did just that countering into the Boston Crab. Carlito however reached the ropes and Punk then hits the springboard clothesline which gives him a near fall. Nice little reversals leads to a kick from Punk, but not enough. Punk hits the corner knee, but as he goes to the Bulldog, Carlito tosses him to the turnbuckle before hitting the backstabber. Unfortunately though, Punk crawled to the outside. Once he tosses him in, Punk kicked out at two. Now the commentary team felt that maybe, just maybe, Carlito would have won by Kana, but his ego got the best of him. As he goes to the backstabber for a second time, Punk counters and hits a brutal looking GTS. One, two, three. Another entertaining match. Carlito and Kayfabe had Punk scouted, and it was clear that he studied him for a bit. Punk, though, was just... One of those guys that were undeniable, I guess. As for the draft pick, it was the Boogeyman, and Taz was all excited, man. You lied. Punk's got a smile on his face as well, but with regards to ECW, I thought SmackDown was the one who was getting shafted on a yearly basis. <laughs> Following this, they brought in Snoop Dogg to speak well about McMahon. However, it was anything but. He poked fun at McMahon for monopolizing the wrestling industry, praised him for featuring guys like John Cena and Stone Cold Steve. Yeah, he called him that. Hoped to get his ass beaten, and basically these guys were in kayfabe, forced to speak well about the boss, but they opted not to. Mick Foley came out not to speak well on a certain boss, but to put his name in the WWE title picture. While he was uninterested in whatever coach says, the one thing that caught his ear was an open WWE Championship match. In his eyes, he met the requirements of featuring in that match, and since he was rehired, technically he was a member of the Raw roster. So Mick Foley was going to be a part of Vengeance, and regarding Mr. McMahon, he said that he has affected the lives of many. He has the power of doing so much good, but he refused to do that. Well, somewhat. McMahon in his eyes was an arrogant, misogynistic egomaniac, and in reality, he lacks friends. Foley mentioned a list of personalities that were rejected, they refused to appear as part of Appreciation Night, and ended up leaving. Okay, for some reason, the feud between McMahon and Foley was planned for years, you know, we'd see Foley speaking bad about him, but it never, never, ever happened. It was planned for a couple of years, one or the other would turn it down, and it just never happened. The next match was between Balls Mahoney, ECW, versus Umaga, Raw. Winner gets the next draft pick. Immediately, Umaga kicked Balls in the face, hit the small and spike, and that's all. Literally two moves. As for the draft pick, it was a huge one. It was King Booker. Joey Styles was all sad over the results because Booker would have been on Tuesday night. And speaking of that, Booker wasn't exactly a fan of the politics on Raw. As a matter of fact, a few others weren't for that matter. Had he been drafted to ECW, he would have quit, and he said this himself in an interview around this time period. We all know how his run went on Raw because of the issues he experienced with the booking, stress of the Benoit tragedy, he left. Meanwhile, Steve-O wrote a little rhyme regarding McMahon and his ass, and unlike the others, he was actually positive towards the boss. The next match was between Bobby Lashley, ECW, and Chris Benoit, SmackDown. So Lashley at this point was being pushed hard. He was on the posters, main event shows that didn't feature Batista or Cena, and it was clear that this guy was a future WWE champion. Like, I'm pretty certain we all would have bet on it at the time. It was basically a foregone conclusion it was gonna happen eventually. Chris Benoit, this one's weird in particular. It was widely respected and was coming off a great US championship reign, but they didn't have any plans for him to ascend to the main event, you know? But anyways, both men had a little stare down bell rings. Lashley with a quick, like, takedown. Benoit tries to go for the crossface. Lashley shows off his power and strength. Benoit is very persistent in locking up that arm, and the ECW champ once again responds with a slam, but it didn't exactly face the former world champion. He then goes for knees and chops, but Lashley answers with a body slam, and JBL on commentary was complaining about the stupid guests talking trash about their boss. He thought it was telling that these men talk bad about him, yet always come back. In the ring, Chris Benoit's cornered Lashley with chops and a snap suplex, but the champ doesn't stay down though as he's got Benoit in torture rack position and slams him on the back of his shoulders. Near fall there. Even though he weathered the storm, Benoit quickly locked in the crossface. Fans go crazy, but Lashley's near the ropes. He showed off his strength, but it was for nothing because Benoit hit a brace of Germans. Lashley fights out of the third attempt, but found himself in the sharpshooter, and it wasn't exactly a problem though because he powered out. Benoit makes a little mistake and takes a running power slam. One, two, three. Cool. That's what did you expect. Lashley was of course limited, but with Benoit taking control, there was no issue. The match itself could have been on pay-per-view, you know, it was that good, it had that much potential. Regarding that draft pick, it ended up being Benoit himself, and JBL almost suffered a stroke. He was completely incensed with what went down and refused to see a match between those two, and Joey Styles and Taz were completely joyous. Like I said, this match was good, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, but again, it was a little thought in the back of my mind over what went down a few weeks later, because this was so damn close to that incident. Like I said in the old ass video, it's even weirder for me to watch Chris Benoit matches from 2007. Next up is Donald Trump on Appreciation Night. He reminded everyone of WrestleMania 23 and thought an Appreciation Night is befitting himself. So it's 3 to 1. McMahon didn't have many supporters, and he also suspended Ashley earlier that week, and so she appeared via satellite on Raw. She thought being suspended over coffee was unbelievable, and again made him seem like such a terrible person, reminding everyone of that night in March of 2001. Those two came out and did the exact same thing, and I was just, I was just confused. But hey, we got another match. 
Next up on Appreciation Night was Jimmy Snuka and the Iron Sheik. Snuka thought it was odd that McMahon was shaken and out of this world. Sheik believed it was because he was screwed at one night stand and he had huge praises for McMahon despite me not understanding much. The next match was between MVP Smackdown and Santino Morella Raw. Bell rings, Jair already predicts MVP's winning as he's throwing Morella around with a gut wrench. Santino responds with a throw and a few arm drags but MVP bounces back with a clubbing clothesline. The US Champion tries slowing things down but almost gives way to a comeback but it turns out MVP's strong enough to withstand the kicks. Santino's taken punishment was still in it. Shoulder tackle from the top repeatedly slams MVP into the turnbuckle. He goes for the flying right and this gets him a two count. MVP doesn't stay down for long, but he screws up and almost takes the L. Irish whip reversal leads to the big boot. Playmaker, and that's all she wrote. It is just there. I wasn't really that interested. I wasn't feeling it. I just didn't like it. The draft pick, though, ended up being Tori Wilson. MVP certainly was happy about this. She came out, posed, and left. And JBL called this a home run, even stating that he'd trade the entire roster for her. And he'd remind us of this about five more times before the night concluded. Okay, Brett the Hitman Hart on Appreciation Night. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't this the first time Hart appeared in some sort of pre-taped video in nine years? You know, I know he appeared at the Hall of Fame, but he never, like, appeared on Raw one way or another. I don't think so. I'm shocked they didn't get the rock, though. But anyways, Hart felt that there wasn't worse to express his appreciation for McMahon. A fist, however, is the best way. Scratch that for them. So, he still hates him, obviously. Okay, what's next? The Miz, SmackDown, faces Snitsky. Winner gets a draft pick. You guys know how it goes. At this point, Snitsky was in the midst of another push and never led to much of a report of the time stated he was pegged to face John Cena for the title. The Miz, on the other hand, was worried over being fired, and right out of the gate, he tried. He tried his best to outsmart Snitsky, but once he was caught, that was it. Body slam gets him a near fall, he hits a clothesline, and then a boot. One, two, three. That's it. Afterwards, though, he continued the attack, killing Miz in the process, but the referee decided to reverse the decision in light of this. Snitsky was completely enraged with this, but what was there to do? And look at the smile Miz had on his face, like I got my ass kicked, but I won. SmackDown ended up getting Chris Masters. Taz called us a big time pick, and he was such a big git that he only wrestled 8 matches on the show. Again, I didn't care about the match, I knew it was going to be a squash. Meanwhile, Bobby the Brain Heenan gave appreciation to McMahon. However, he put over his ruthlessness, stating that McMahon has hired many people, but he's also put many out of work as well. Next up, Roddy Roddy Piper was going to give appreciation to the boss. He thought that he was the best choice to appreciate McMahon. Then Hot Rod began sharing some of the boss's proudest moments. These moments consisted of ass-kissing, beer bass, wetting the ring. And on behalf of the fans, Roddy Piper said that they appreciate Vince McMahon for what he really is. A joke, I guess. Time for some Divas action. Before that could go down, Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, gave praises to McMahon for being a very, very great entrepreneur. Okay, Candice Michelle at Raw faces Crystal Smackdown. So at this point in time, Candice Michelle turned into quite the worker. Like for 2007 standards, she was pretty good. Crystal's in a kayfabe relationship with Teddy Long, you know, we gotta talk about that. She had some generic mid-2000s club music. Bell rings, Crystal immediately goes for a boot, pulls her down by the hair. Michelle quickly hits an end security, begins her comeback, you know, backbreak her elbow, and that gives her a two count. Crystal fights back for all of two seconds as Michelle uses the ropes to her advantage. And as she goes for something, Candice hits a spin kick. One. Two, three, that's all she wrote. Eh, whatever. I wasn't bored with the action because it was short. Draft pick, though, goes to Raw. They built up some suspense, and it was a huge game because it was Bobby Lashley. The ECW champion was now on Raw, and poor ECW was getting their stars taken away with no actual returns. Well, they had been well at the time. All of a sudden, the coach interrupted. Why is that? Well, since he was drafted to Raw, and since Vince hates him, he stripped to the ECW title. Lashley, of course, wasn't happy, but on Raw, he was going to be champion. That's it. Because of this, Lashley was given the moniker of uncrowned champion, and you'd hear that about 20,000 times in the next month. Following this was a triple threat match. Jeff Hardy of Raw... Elijah Burke of ECW and Batista of SmackDown. Well, this was over before he began, right? See, Jeff Hardy at this time period wasn't as strong as he would end up becoming by the end of the year. He wasn't an upper mid-carder, he was a straight-up mid-carder, that's all. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, but was this the first and only time Batista faced Jeff Hardy? Burke tried avoiding conflict, but was thrusted in the middle of it, and just watching this match, how in the hell did him Jeff Hardy face Batista? He goes to the bomb, but Hardy counters, hits a forearm, and even connects with a whisper in the wind. The Swanton was successful as well, but Burke breaks the fall, and I forgot he was even in the match at this point. Quickly, he goes to work trying to end the match, and just because he looked like a schmuck initially, wasn't the case here. JBL, meanwhile, was praying that Cole gets drafted to OVW, and in the ring, Hardy was quick, giving caution to the wind. He kicked Burke around, but he learned that high-risk moves are just that. Batista comes in, hits the spine buster on both opponents before wrapping it up with a Batista bomb on Elijah Burke. One, two, three. Ah, damn it. The one match I wanted to see more of ended quickly like that. I was enjoying seeing Batista and Jeff Hardy go at it, you know, first time ever, but it is what it is. Afterwards, the randomizer played, and it ended up being Ric Flair. 
JBL and Batista were over the moon at the sight of Ric Flair, and you know what? he ended up wrestling a handful of matches on SmackDown. He was threatening to quit, he was angry over his booking and all that, and that's what led to the WrestleMania 24 story. Next up, Captain Lou Albano was to give appreciation to Mr. McMahon. As expected, he trashed the boss and then someone in the arena, the American Dream Dusted Rhodes, came out to honor McMahon. He talked about his work ethic and his persistence in being successful, and it didn't matter if he had to step on others. I well, don't have to like his psychology of this industry, you got to respect it, you know, Mr. McMahon. Basically, Rose didn't make it seem like he was a fan of the boss, quite the contrary, but decided to focus on the business side of Mr. McMahon playing it safe. Afterwards, me and Gene Okerlund gave his respect to McMahon, and he talked about how he was given the spot to be the host of Tuesday Night Titans, when McMahon knew damn well that the show was being cancelled. He was also fired despite being a tenured member of the company, but hey, at least he got a fine job down in Atlanta. And the main event, a 15-man tri-branded battle royal. Competitors in this match, for the most part, were lower card, mid card guys. Okay, bell rings. The commentary once again reminded us that the big guys have a huge advantage. Striker was the first one to get thrown out, and also I just realized that this was a free for all. Like I thought this match was supposed to have teamwork in it. Sandman picked the wrong fight, leaving ECW with three other men, and on the other side, Rigo and Chavo were thrown out. By Mark Henry. JBL's angry over this, but Cole suggested he go tell him, you know? As they're talking about this, Tommy Dreamer's thrown out, and you could feel the ECW commentary team's pain. Henry was dominant, he punched out Kevin Thorne, knocked out Randy Orton, and Viscera was destroying anybody in his path as well. This led to a huge clash between both Titans. Henry delivered a blow that knocked Viscera's teeth out of his throat by the looks of it, yet it wasn't enough to throw him out. Regardless of what went down, Henry managed to toss him right out of the match. After the commercial break, Corvant's in a dangerous situation, Dykstra and Eugene were eliminated beforehand, Hardy managed to get the fans behind him and managed to eliminate Corvan after dodging the pounds, and Nitro meanwhile was going for a springboard and Orin drop kicked him out. Hardy was really building momentum at this point, he bounced Masters on out of there, he held on and got rid of Henry leading to a showdown with Randy Orin. As the Legend Killers attempted an RKO, Hardy counters leading to the side effect, Orin quickly bounced back though with a backbreaker, but once both men recover, Hardy's in control. He was looking for the twist of fate, but Orin just threw him onto the apron and uppercutted him out to win the match. Wow. I love Battle Royals. You guys know what I think about this. I like it, of course. This gave Raw two draft picks. Those picks ended up being Snitsky, of course, from ECW. I mean, ECW just had to have its stars taken away. The second pick absolutely obliterated JBL. Why? Because it was Mr. Kennedy, the fastest rising star in SmackDown history. Well, the landscape did sort of change, you know, from the bottom, but from the top, there wasn't much that changed. Meanwhile, Vince McMahon was pacing around with a worry on his mind, and it was looking like he was coming out to the arena. In the meantime, Stone Cold Steve Austin spoke about Appreciation Day, and he said that he appreciates the opportunity to drive a beer truck to the ring and spray his boss with beer. He appreciated filling McMahon's car with cement. He loved beating his ass in the hospital, and best of all, he thanked him for allowing him to drive in a Zamboni and deliver an ass whooping. Austin clearly wasn't fond of McMahon screwing him over, you know, ever since day one, he's hated the man, and if only they released this promo uncensored. Jerry Lawler himself couldn't believe that this had aired on TV. Okay, Vince McMahon came out all emotionless, he looked completely lost, so lost that Justin Roberts had to enter the ring and give him a microphone. He was shaking with fear, I assume, and he ended up dropping the mic. Damn, that was a 5-star promo. The commentary team felt that it was odd that McMahon lacked any sense of swagger, words, everything. Like, everything was so damn different about the man, it was a shell of himself. Then, he walked to the back of the slice smirk, and there, every single superstar that wasn't a main eventer was lined up. McMahon was walking towards the wrong direction, and this guy had a smile on his face because he wanted to. I don't know why the hell he had a smile on his face. He thought he was gonna stick it to the company or something. Turns out he punished himself and his partner. As McMahon exits the building, he felt a sense of paranoia. As he enters the limousine, shuts the door, it explodes! Oh my, Michael Cole. In all seriousness though, it's insane to see that WWE was gonna have a storyline in which Mr. McMahon died. It's something that rarely occurs in pro wrestling, and WWE clearly wanted a huge summer angle in order to increase ratings, and this was a good-ass way of doing that. It just lied in their efforts afterwards, you know, it was it looked promising. It was the best ending to a Raw episode in years, probably. With regards to the incident, a lot of people thought it was legit. The FBI was even contacted about the limousine explosion, and according to the Wrestling Observer, the storyline wasn't even new. It was actually pitched for Carlito to have somebody trigger a bomb in Teddy Long's car back in 2005. Upon reading this, I was laughing my ass off because of the thought of Carlito going that far just because the GM was punishing him seems so far-fetched. And that's what they thought as well. Because of the storyline, WWE and Vince McMahon's search activity increased tenfold on Yahoo.com and a bunch of other websites. And another thing to mention is that there was some consideration in canceling the storyline because of Sherry Martell. Stuff was just completely insane. Following this episode, a supplement draft was held on WWE.com. Raga Davari, William Regal, Jillian, The Sandman, and Lundrick. 
ECW received Viscera, The Miz, and John Morrison. SmackDown got Kenny Dykstra, Eugene, Hardcore Holly, who didn't even join the brand, ended up going to Raw a few weeks later, The Major Brothers, and Victoria. Out of all the brands, I'd say ECW won the lottery for obvious reasons, that being The Miz and John Morrison. Big Daddy V felt like somewhat of a big deal on the brand, so there's that. Now, what do I think about this draft? Honestly, I think it's the weakest of the 2000s. Why? Because the guys who were drafted didn't make a huge impact. The only person that did make a huge impact was the great Kali. When we look at it from today's perspective, it looks weak, but at the time, it was it looked very optimistic. You know, Ben Watts, ECW, Lashley to Raw, where he was going to face John Cena, Mr. Kennedy to Raw. It was looking optimistic, but like I said, looking at it from today, it was weak, in my eyes at least. What do you guys think of this draft? Please comment down below. That's it for this video. Make sure you hit a Batista bomb on the like button and perhaps the RK on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.